and welcome to the Hill. Once again, we've been blown away by the take up for this event, with around 500 people having registered to attend. And we'd like to thank you for taking time out to join us this morning. Now, I won't read the housekeeping slide in full, but I would just highlight three things. Firstly, you can download today's slides from the related contents box on the screen. Secondly, this webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to use the same joining link you used this morning to access the recording. Thirdly, when you leave the webinar, you'll be asked to complete a short survey. And we would be very grateful if you could take just a few seconds to give us your feedback on today's event. Now, regular attenders will know the format for these events. Um, and once again, we have three fantastic speakers for you today. In a few moments, we'll start with Grant Anderson, our Head of Planning, who will be delivering the latest of his regular planning updates. Grant will be followed by Rachel Allen from our real estate team, who will be discussing rooftop solar installations. And last but not least, Ralph Bullivant from our real estate litigation team will be looking at what's new in the world of landlord and tenant. We will then have time for some questions. So please type your questions in the box and submit them as we go. And I will ask as many as I can to our speakers at the end before we send you on your way no later than 11.30. But before I hand you over to Grant, I'd just like to mention that the autumn edition of our regular real estate newsletter was published last week. If you're on our mailing list for Real Estate Matters, this should have landed in your inbox last Thursday. Now, if you're not on our mailing list, or if it didn't arrive for any reason, there is a direct link to the newsletter on screen in the related content box, immediately under the link to today's slides. And if you're not receiving our newsletters and event invitations, maybe you picked up today's event um, from our website um, or from social media, then there's also a link in that same box to subscribe or to update your preferences. Now, the autumn newsletter contains updates on several topics that we have covered at recent spring and autumn updates, such as number one, the Building Safety Act, where many of the outstanding provisions came into force this week on the 1st of October, which was also the deadline for the registration of existing higher risk buildings before the criminal offences came into play on Sunday. A higher risk building being a building which contains at least two residential units and is at least 18 metres or seven storeys high. Number two, the register of overseas entities. Now the register has passed its first birthday on 1st August. The annual updating duty is now relevant. With failure to comply, meaning that a, uh, as an overseas entity landowner cannot satisfy the new land registration requirements, even though it may have an overseas entity ID number. The newsletter also contains an article on rooftop solar, which is, of course, one of the topics uh, being discussed this morning. Now, one important development that occurred too late to make it into the newsletter, although we did touch on it on our regular quarterly column in the Estates Gazette, is the apparent government U-turn on MEES the minimum energy efficiency standard um, for residential properties. So you might remember this slide from the spring update. The blue rows at the top show the now completed first phase of needs. So a minimum standard of an EPC rating of E now applying to all new and existing residential and commercial leases. The pink rows at the bottom show the government's proposed trajectory to ratchet up the minimum standard that was consulted on in 2021. But then Michael Gove said over the summer that this was asking too much too quickly of landlords in the private rented sector and we should relax the pace. And the Prime Minister's comments last week um, suggest that the proposed me increase um, from E to C for residential lettings is now going to be scrapped altogether. Who knows where that leaves the Mies proposals for commercial property? And you may have seen the British Property Federation's recent call for some regulatory certainty on this point. But I've been talking for long enough, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our esteemed Head of Planning, Grant Anderson. 
Thank you, Bill, and good morning, everybody. Right, in my session, I'm just going to look at a few recent planning cases from 2023 uh, and just to look at the practical implications of the court decisions in those cases. The uh, first area I want to look at is use classes. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the amendments to the use classes order introduced in 2020. The purpose of those amendments was to streamline the planning system, planning system provide much more uh, flexibility. And one of the key mechanisms was the introduction of use class E, which was a single use class effectively replacing eight elements of the previous use classes, which I've listed on the left hand side of the slide. And obviously the, the principal benefit of that is that if, if you've got a use for any of those on the that were formerly in separate use classes in the red box and you want to change to another, now that they're all in use class E, you can do so without having to go and obtain planning permission. So a much simpler um, procedure. What I now want to look at is just a 2023 case that has potential implications on that. And the case in question is Lazarus Properties. Uh, and this case related to the Brunswick Shopping Centre in Bloomsbury, London. Very briefly, the facts. In 2003, planning permission had been granted for a substantial refurbishment of the shopping centre. And that included A1, A2 and A3 uses, so retail, financial, professional services and uh, cafe restaurant uses. That permission was subject to a condition, condition three, which provided that up to a maximum of 40% of the retail floor space is permitted to be used within A2 and A3 use classes. So the purpose of that condition uh, on the permission was expressed to be to safeguard the retail function and character of the shopping centre. In 2022, the owner of the shopping centre applied for a lawful development certificate, and that certificate sought to certify that the whole of the shopping centre fell within use class E. And the reasoning behind that application was firstly to provide clarity, to confirm that the condition didn't affect uh, the shopping centre being within use class E. And obviously the principal benefit to the owners was that that would then maximise the flexibility and ability to change uses within the wider use class E. The matter ended up in the High Court and the question before the court was whether the changes in 2020 and the creation of the new use class E effectively overrode and superseded condition three, or whether that condition continued to apply and would affect the operation of the use classes order in respect of the property and how the property could be used. Now, the High Court held that whilst the wording of condition three did not expressly exclude the operation of the use classes order, it clearly evinced an intention to do so. And the court found that that, together with the stated purpose of the condition to protect the retail character of the shopping centre, was sufficient to hold that condition three remained effective and had an exclusionary effect, i.e. excluded the operation of the use classes order. So the consequence of that decision was that the shopping centre did not benefit from the full flexibility within use class E, and it was still subject to that condition. In terms of the sort of takeaway points from that case, I think sort of firstly, yes, use class E does provide considerable flexibility, and we're all benefiting from that. But the position remains that you cannot ignore the planning history of a property. You do need to check, particularly when purchasing a property or entering into a lease, that there's not a planning condition attached to an earlier permission, which has the effect of excluding or limiting the scope of any use classes rights on the property and may mean that you need planning permission, even though at first glance, you thought it was within use class E and you didn't. So that's a potentially important case. The next area I want to look at is a recent enforcement case. And this related to the premises known as the Dubai Cafe on the famous Curry Mile, Rush Home, Manchester. The property in question was owned by TM Investments Limited, and they let the property to a tenant. The property had planning permission to operate as a restaurant, but the tenant, however, 
had operated it as a shisha smoking venue and had made unauthorised alterations to facilitate that use. The local planning authority got wind of that. They issued an enforcement notice requiring the shisha venue to cease and to require the unauthorised alterations to be removed. Now, that notice took effect, and despite the fact that it took effect, the tenant continued to operate the property as a shisha smoking venue, and this went on for a further four years. Now, under the Town and Country Planning Act, where an enforcement notice is not complied with, that's a criminal offence, and it's not only a criminal offence by the person continuing to operate the premises, but as we see from section 1792, it's a criminal offence by the owner of the property. Section 1793 provides a defence for the owner in any such proceedings, that it's a defence if he can show that he did everything he could be expected to do to secure compliance. Now, in the Dubai Cafe case, the local planning authority brought criminal proceedings, but they went against the landlord, the owner of the property, presumably because got deeper pockets. They pleaded guilty to the charge and received a fine for £18,000 and an award of costs. But the sting in the tail is that the local planning authority also obtained a confiscation order against the landlord under the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. And this was on the basis that the landlord had benefited financially from the criminal activity. The criminal activity, of course, was the continued operation of the shisha bar in contravention of the enforcement notice, which, as we've just seen, is a criminal offence. And the financial benefit was the continued receipt of the landlord of rent over that four-year period. So the landlord was required to pay under the confiscation order the sum of £174,000, a considerably larger penalty than the fine under the Town and Country Planning Act. The takeaway points from this case, I think, are that as a landlord, you cannot assume where there is a breach of planning control and enforcement proceedings that it's just a matter for your tenant. Whilst leases invariably contain obligations and covenants on tenants to comply with planning law, a landlord cannot sit back and rely on that, and it's of little help to the landlord in relation to any enforcement proceedings that may be brought by the local planning authority. To be able to rely on the defence in section 1793, it's clear that a landlord will need to be far more proactive to be able to demonstrate he's done everything that could be reasonably expected to secure compliance. And I think in the case of the Dubai Cafe case, that inevitably would have meant the landlord should have forfeited the lease. Now, whilst at the time that may have been unattractive because it would leave him with an empty property, in the longer term, it would have been in a better position because four years down the line, the landlord ends up with an empty property, but he's also lost the rent for the previous four years. So that's, a, I think, a potentially important case to be aware of. Next, I want to look at Section 73 applications and a couple of recent cases. So just firstly, what does Section 73 say? It says that it permits planning applications to develop land without compliance with conditions, subject to which a previous planning permission was granted. So it's used to vary existing planning permissions. And there's been a considerable body of case law that's built up over the years on the use of Section 73. And I'm just going to look very briefly at two of the leading cases, and then I'm going to look briefly at two of the cases in 2023 on the use of Section 73. So the first case is the Arrowcroft case. In that case, the original permission, the operative part, and when I say the operative part, that is the description of development for which planning permission has grant, been granted, included one food store and one variety store variety superstore. A Section 73 application was made and was granted by the authority to vary a condition to that permission. And the effect of the condition was to replace the single variety superstore with six non-food store units. Came before the courts and the court held that decision was unlawful. And the High Court held that under Section 73, a local planning authority can amend conditions attached to the original permission 
but only if the new stroke amended conditions are ones which they could have lawfully imposed on the original permission in the sense that they do not amount to a fundamental alteration. The court held that when the original planning commission had expressly permitted in the operative part a single superstore, the imposition of a condition which replaced that with six units would be fundamentally inconsistent and therefore the decision was struck down. So that's Arrowcroft. In 2020, we had further useful guidance from the Court of Appeal in the Finney case. Very briefly, the facts. The operative part of the original permission was for two wind turbines with a tip height of up to 100 metres. A Section 73 application was made to vary a condition to that permission, and the effect of the variation would be to increase the maximum height of the wind turbines to 125 metres. There would therefore be a conflict or inconsistency between the operative part of the original reference to 100 metres and the effect of the variation. On appeal, an inspector approved the section 73, but to overcome that difficulty, he struck out the reference to 100 metres in the operative part. The matter came before the courts and the court of appeal held that it's not possible under section 73 to amend the operative part of a planning permission and that section 73 is limited to amendments to conditions only. So the decision was struck down. So that's Finney. In 2023, as I say, there have been two cases. The first of those is the Armstrong case. And in the Armstrong case, planning permission was granted for a single dwelling house. That was the operative part of the permission. A condition was attached to that permission which specified the approved plans that would control the development, including the floor plans, the elevations, the design of the house, etc. An application was made to vary that condition by substituting new plans for effectively a different design style of house. Now, the council refused that Section 73 application. It went to appeal and the appeal was dismissed by the inspector. The inspector concluded that firstly, the nature of the development, i.e. the new dwelling house, was substantially different to the original planning permission. And secondly, he said that the nature of the application went beyond the parameters of being a minor material amendment, and it, therefore it was beyond the scope of Section 73. And I think in that respect, the inspector was probably having regard to national planning practice guidance, which cites minor material amendments as being one of the uses for Section 73 applications. So he dismissed that appeal. The matter came before the High Court, and the High Court held that the inspector's decision was unlawful and quashed the decision. The court held that the Section 73 application had sought to amend the conditions only, and it did not conflict on its face with the operative part of the original permission. The court further held that there's nothing in Section 73 that limits its application to minor material amendments or amendments which do not involve a fundamental alteration. The court held if that had been the intention of Section 73, then the section would have said so. The court held that if a condition has varied, does not conflict with the operative part of the original permission on its face, then that is sufficient, even though the substance of the change may be substantial. So it's a, a broader approach on the use of Section 73. The second case in 2023, sorry, I'll just skip on there, is the case of Fisk. And in that case, the original planning permission had been for the development of a solar farm. The operative part of the permission had been uh, for a solar farm, including ground-mounted mounted solar panels and an electricity substation. A Section 73 permission was granted to vary the conditions of that original permission, and the effect of the Section 73 was to remove the substation from the development, as the operator had obtained a different consent, standalone consent in that element. The matter ended up in the High Court, and the High Court reviewed the various legal cases on Section 73, and it concluded that the Section 73 permission was unlawful for several reasons. 
Firstly, it held that under Section 73, there is no power to introduce a condition which conflicts with or is inconsistent with the operative part of the original permission. That's consistent with Finney, Arrowcroft and Armstrong. And in this case, it was inconsistent because the operative part referred to a substation as part of the development, but the very condition omitted that. The court held that any inconsistency is fatal and it does not need to be fundamental. So that's the first limitation in Fisk on the use of Section 73. The second limitation the court held was that Section 73 cannot be used where the varied condition would constitute a fundamental alteration to the original permission. And that limitation would apply even if the varied condition was consistent on its face with the operative part of the original permission. So in terms of the takeaways from those cases, it's clear that the second limitation in Fisk appears to be contrary to the court's view in Armstrong, i.e. whether or not you can achieve a fundamental alteration under Section 73. So there's clearly scope for some greater clarity on the use of Section 73 in the light of court decisions. In the short term, that means one needs to proceed with care when using Section 73 to make sure that the nature of your amendments fall on the right side of the line. I think it also indicates a need for a further review of the use of Section 73 and indeed amendments to planning permissions, not least because in the light of Finney, Section 73 can only be used to vary conditions. There is no scope to amend the operative part of the, an earlier permission. The only scope we have at the moment is Section 96A, which is very limited and limited to non-material amendments. So there's no wider scope to amend a description of development on an earlier permission. Now, in that respect, the government's looking at a new mechanism in the levelling up and regeneration bill that's currently before Parliament. The proposal is to introduce a new Section 73B that will enable an existing planning permission to be amended either in respect of its conditions or in relation to the operative part of the permission. And the qualification is that provided the authority is satisfied that the effect will not be substantially different from the existing permission. So I think that amendment will be helpful in terms of allowing amendments to the operative part of a permission. So we wait that uh, with bated breath. The final area I want to look at is Section 106 contributions, in particular healthcare contributions, which are frequently sought in practice. But the starting, the starting point for any Section 106 financial contribution is Regulation 122 of the Community and Infrastructure Levy Regulations. Reg 122 provides that a planning obligation, i.e. a Section 106, may only constitute a reason for granting planning permission for development if the obligation is necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms, directly related to the development and fairly and reasonably related in scale and kind to the development. And if a Section 106 contribution doesn't meet these tests, then it shouldn't be sought or imposed and any planning permission that does is potentially unlawful. So in 2023, there have been a couple of cases that have been before the courts on this. Both cases have related to significant residential led developments. Both cases have involved NHS trusts seeking a financial contribution to address the impacts on health services arising from significant new residents at these large new residential developments. In both cases, the trusts argue that there's a funding gap in the first year of occupation of the new development because the trusts annual funding arrangements are calculated on the basis of the previous year's population. And in the first year of occupation, that would not take account of the new residents. Now in the Worcestershire case, the trust sought a contribution of 1.8 million. The Leicester case, the trust sought a contribution of 914,000 pounds. In both cases, the local planning authorities concluded that the trust had not demonstrated clearly that there would be a funding gap attributable to the developments 
and they concluded that they could not ask the developer to make a Section 106 contribution because to do so would be contrary to the Regulation 122. Obviously, the Trust's not happy about that, and both cases ended up in the High Court. Both cases became, sorry, came before Mr Just, Justice Holgate, and he determined that whether or not there was a funding gap and whether or not it was necessary for a financial contribution to be made to make the development acceptable was a matter for the local planning authority to determine, exercising its judgment on the basis of the available evidence. And on the facts of both cases, the court held that the local planning authorities had been entitled to conclude that the trusts had not demonstrated a funding gap that therefore the grant of planning permissions without such a contribution was lawful and would not be quashed. Now, whilst those two decisions are fact specific, they do potentially have wider implications. The takeaway points are, firstly, it emphasizes the position that financial contributions under section 106 must be justified on evidence to enable them to be secured. So an authority seeking to secure a, secure a contribution must have the evidence to demonstrate it. Equally so, a developer who's being asked to pay a contribution should be checking and testing whether the, the development, the contribution, sorry, uh, is justified on the evidence. So that's the first point. The second point is it signals, I think, the difficulties that NHS trusts are facing and are going to face to secure financial contributions on the basis of funding gaps, because both were unsuccessful. The third point is that Mr Justice Holgate commented in his judgment in the Leicester case that if there is a systemic problem in how national health resources are distributed to local NHS trusts, then that raises a question whether it's appropriate to require Section 106 contributions from individual developers. And that seems to me to be an indication that it's not appropriate. The judge commented further that those issues merit further consideration as a matter of policy outside the courts and even the planning appeals system. And again, I think that's a clear indication that the courts think this is a matter that requires addressing at a policy level outside the planning system and certainly not through the courts. So we'll have to see how that plays out. So that concludes my sort of whistle-stop tour through some recent planning cases. I will now pass you on to Rachel, who will talk to you about rooftop solar installations. Thanks, Grant. Morning, everybody, and thank you again for joining us today. I'm going to talk about rooftop solar systems, particularly in the context of landlord and tenant relationships. I'm interested in renewable energy as a tool that can help reduce emissions from fossil fuels, diversify energy supply, protect against increasing energy prices, reduce dependence on imported fuels, and boost reputation, helping to drive new business and retain existing business as organizations move towards net zero. And I want to concentrate today on solar because the technology has come on so much during the last decade, making it more efficient and increasingly attractive to occupiers and investors. In my experience, it's something that is coming up with increasing frequency in the context of landlord and tenant matters, both at heads of term stage and during the life of leases. I'm hopeful that there'll be something interesting in this presentation for everybody attending today. Let's start with the science bit. A photovoltaic panel, otherwise known as a PV panel or a solar panel, contains PV cells that absorb the sun's light and convert solar energy into electricity. These cells are made of a semiconductor that transmits energy, for example, silicon. The cells are strung together to create a module. When the semiconductor in the PV panel absorbs sunlight, it knocks electrons, which form the basis of electricity, which then flows through the semiconductor. These dislodged electrons carry a negative charge and flow across the cell towards the front surface. Um, sorry, creating an imbalance in charge between the front and the back. This imbalance in turn creates a voltage potential like the negative and positive terminals of a battery, and that creates electricity. The current is then collected on wires, either consumed immediately, stored in a battery component of the PV system, 
or exported to the grid. By the way, it's not true that solar cells only work when the sun is shining, but they won't generate as much power on a cloudy day as on a sunny day. Just looking briefly on what's typically comprised in a typical rooftop PV system. First, the modules or solar panels. These need to be supported by structures that fix them to the roof. If you have a flat roof, then support structures exist that can modify the orientation of the panels to optimize their exposure by tilting them towards the sun's rays. The inverter is the electronic device that transforms the energy produced by the modules into electricity. Depending on the size of a PV system, there may be more than one inverter. Electric cables carry energy from the system to the users. Monitoring systems track energy production, consumption, output to the grid, and the status of the inverters. Some systems may also have a storage component. I might add so that there's no doubt, a PV system would not typically take premises completely off grid. You still need to be connected to mains electricity. The mains electricity will run the PV system itself, and usually any excess electricity produced by the PV system will be exported to the national grid. Now, rooftop solar is not a good solution for all properties. Before you can know if solar is a good solution for you, a survey will need to be carried out. The location of the building needs to be considered. Typically, there's a small difference in annual hours of sunlight between the north and south of Great Britain. So you can expect a solar system to perform slightly better in the south than the north, all other things being equal. However, some buildings may not be suitable because of the physical characteristics of the roof including its orientation and or shading from surrounding tall buildings or trees. A solar installation, sorry, a solar installer should be able to assess your building, its suitability for solar, the size of solar installation and type of panels that can be supported, ideal placement of panels and purchase and installation costs. The roof will need to be professionally inspected to make sure it's in good condition and strong enough to bear the weight of the proposed solar panels. Finally, costs need to be considered. If the roof isn't strong enough or is not in good repair, then the reinforcement works or remedial works may be possible to fix that, but you'll need to factor those into the cost. Then in all cases, there'll be the cost of purchasing and installing the PV system. Once you know all of the likely costs of installing a PV system that's suitable for your premises, you then need to consider the cost savings and revenues that the system's likely to generate. The solar installer should be able to give you a forecast of the amount of electricity that will be generated by the PV system, and such forecasts are likely to be given as a range. The more electricity consumed at the premises, which can be drawn from the PV system, the bigger cost savings available. And the less electricity produced by the PV system that's consumed, the more electricity will be available to sell. I've recently considered having a PV system installed at my home And I'm going to talk about that now because I think some of the things that I've considered are things that any occupier or owner will consider when they are considering whether to have a PV system installed. Now, the physical size of my roofs dictate how many panels can be installed and their orientation dictates how much sunlight is likely to hit those panels. If a PV system were installed, I'd expect it to be smaller and produce a lower amount of electricity than a typical domestic system serving a home of a similar size to mine. Also, the amount of electricity typically consumed by my household is lower than average for a household of similar size. And most of our electricity is consumed of an evening when the PV system wouldn't. That behavior would limit the amount of cost savings available. And then there's been a change of rates as well. So the rates currently um, receivable under the SEG scheme are lower than would have been receivable a few years ago under the feed-in tariff. If I were to sell my home, I think I would not be able to recover the capital costs of installation. I don't think it would enhance market value. It would be possible in theory to move the panels to a new house, but that would risk damaging the panels. It would also 
add to the expense of moving, and there's no guarantee that the panels would be suitable at my new property. So I've concluded that a PV system is not for me. However, if we're looking at a warehouse or a distribution centre with significant roof space and, and commercial premises, which my clients often are, then the situation is slightly different. You might be able to claim capital allowances against some of the initial capital expenditure in installing the PV system, and a suitable PV system might deliver cost savings of around 60% if it's occupier installed or double digit annual investment returns if installed by a landlord. So in these types of circumstances, the payback period is likely to be more attractive and you can see why a PV system might be more suitable. In all cases, when considering installing a PV system, a reputable manufacturer should be used and contractors with appropriate indemnity insurance. You need to make sure that appropriate product guarantees and warranties are available to affect to benefit, sorry, the property owner and tenants and funders. I mentioned the Smart Export Guarantee or SEG system just before. As, and I also mentioned that if you own a PV system, then any energy that it produces is generally yours to consume for free. If you produce more electricity than you consume and you have a storage system, then you can use it later when it's not put out or you can sell unconsumed electricity. You might sell electricity by putting it back in the grid or if you're a landlord, you might sell it to occupiers of your building or perhaps your estate. The current scheme for putting electricity back into the grid and selling it to an electricity company is the SEG system. It's a government backed initiative that was introduced in January 2020. Under the scheme, licensed electricity suppliers, known as SED licensees, are required to pay small-scale generators for the low-cost carbon electricity which they export back to the national grid, providing certain criteria are met. SED licensees are the big electricity companies who are mandated to be licensed electricity suppliers and some other suppliers who have joined the scheme voluntarily. The eligibility criteria requires that PV systems are located in Great Britain, have a capacity of up to 5 megawatts, a quick Google search indicates that a 5 megawatt capacity will typically produce enough electricity to power more than 1,350 homes. To satisfy the eligibility criteria, the installer and some, sorry, the installation and sometimes the installer must be suitably certified. And the PV system must be connected to an export meter and have an MPAN number. You apply for an SEG tariff directly to an SEG licensee. You can apply to any SCG licensee. You don't have to go with the same company that's supplying electricity to the premises, and it's worth shopping around. The SCG licensee will review the application and confirm if the PV system is eligible and will determine the rate, contract length, and other terms that you'll receive under an SCG agreement. Power purchase agreements, often referred to as PPAs, are a contract between an electricity generator and the party who is purchasing the power. The PPA is a contract under which most of a solar installation's revenues will be earned when installed by a landlord and electricity is sold to a tenant. Consequently, the PPA underpins the economics of most landlord rooftop solar projects. The majority of PPAs in a landlord and tenant context will be what is known as exempt supply arrangements, and they contain provisions dealing with the following issues. Commencement and term. Commencement is likely to be the date that the solar installation is up and running and delivering power, and the term is likely to be tied to the lease. Usually there will be termination rights for unremedied material breach, failure to pay undisputed amounts, insolvency and force majeure. A termination payment may be required if termination is triggered by a fault, and this might include the non-defaulting party, sorry, the, part, the defaulting party paying the non-defaulting party's direct costs, losses, and expenses incurred as a result of the early termination of the PPA. Sale and purchase of electricity. Generally, renewable benefits will accrue to the landlord and it'll be free to sell those. The tenant will be obliged to purchase the electricity generated by the solar installation in preference to mains electricity. The tenant will normally have the exclusive right to consume the electricity and won't be permitted to sell it on. The pricing is typically lower than the mains electricity and it can be fixed for the duration of the PPA or index linked or linked to a prevailing price on the power exchange. 
And if the price is not fixed, the parties will often agree a cap and a collar. It's possible to contract for a specific volume of electricity that the installation is required to produce, and that might have percentage tolerances attached to it. And moving outside those tolerances could have pricing or other consequences, such as liquidated damages for undersupply. In my experience, landlords can be hesitant to commit to providing a fixed volume of electricity because solar is intermittent, but it should be possible to specify a minimum amount based on forecasting. Forecasting is based on the anticipated production that the solar manufacturer installers indicate, and it takes into account anticipated downtime for maintenance. The other thing that you should take into account is that solar systems become less efficient over their life, life span. So the forecasting that the landlord provides needs to be quite modest um, or conservative. Forecasts can allow the tenant to manage variability in the supply by adapting to periods of low generation, for example, by switching off non-urgent equipment during downtime for maintenance and the like. Connection to the grid will need to be maintained and there'll be meters measuring electricity consumed from each source, PV system and mains, and a meter recording electricity exported to the grid. There may be provisions to check metering accuracy. Assignment and subcontracting are usually restricted for both parties. Um, changes in law, I've mentioned this because these types of clauses are unusual in property contracts, but they're generally quite common in PPAs. They require renegotiation of terms if there's a change in law, and sometimes if there's a change in the commercial backdrop against which the PPA was negotiated. The PPA for rooftop solar in a landlord and tenant context may appear as a schedule within the lease, or it might be a standalone agreement. I'm aware of at least one landlord who has considered um, installing rooftop solar across its portfolio, its industrial portfolio, under airspace leases. And its intention there was to either package up the solar installations and PPAs and sell it on as a separate investment or to draw income. Now, if the PPA is part of the lease, it's really difficult to disentangle it and have a separate investment that way. But if it's standalone, if it's something, well, not standalone, but if it sits alongside the lease, then it's much easier to package up into an investment. Looking now at solar installations made by tenants. If you're a tenant and you want to install a PV system, then the first thing we need to check is the lease to make sure that you've got the necessary rights to install and operate the PV system. Most leases have restrictions on alterations, so we'd need to check that clause in the lease and if appropriate, seek the landlord's consent to the installation. If the lease does not permit external or structural alterations, which many don't, it's still worth speaking to the landlord as they may still be willing to agree to the PV system being installed. The landlord may even agree to install the PV system at its own cost, but oblige you to purchase the electricity generated by it. Now, if a tenant installs a PV system, it won't usually form part of the demise. Tenants are typically obliged to remove all alterations that they've made during the life of the lease and to reinstate the premises at the end of the lease, but the parties can agree otherwise. It might be difficult to procure removal of things like meters, and it may, depending on the term of the lease and the anticipated lifespan of the PV system, be in both parties' interest to agree that the PV system should be yielded up with the premises in working order at the end of the lease term. The tenant should seek an express consent in the lease to export any electricity that's produced by the PV system to the grid and to receive payment for that. To do this, the tenant would need to enter into an SEG agreement with an SEG licensee, as I mentioned before and we probably look to include an express consent in the user clause of the lease. We need to think about underletting too. Some scenarios that might arise are that the tenant might want to underlet the whole of the premises and include the PV system in that underlease, or the tenant may wish to be able to underlet only the PV system and then enter into a PPA and purchase electricity from its under tenant, with the under tenant entering into an SEG agreement to sell unconsumed electricity back to the grid or the tenant may wish to retain the PV system and the space it occupies and only underlet the balance of the premises, entering into a PPA to sell electricity to its under tenant and or an SEG agreement to sell unconsumed electricity back into the grid. <laughs> 
We'd need to address all of these points in the lease, whether we're negotiating a new lease or varying an existing lease to accommodate tenants' installation of a PV system. And we'd mostly be looking at the alienation and the user clauses when considering these points. Looking now at PV systems installed by landlords. If the landlord wants to install a PV system, we need to consider the extent of the demise. Is the roof where the PV panels are placed and or the airspace above the roof included or excluded from the demise? Next, we need to make sure that the lease reserves necessary rights for the landlord to install, retain and retain the system and possibly the roof where the panels are placed if the landlord is to take on a repair obligation for that. And I have seen a number of instances where the landlord is willing to do so. We should think about how, on a practical level, installation, maintenance and repair will be carried out. Will the landlord need scaffolding or cherry pickers to clean, maintain and repair the PV panels? And has it got the right to bring those onto the premises? And if it does, how will that affect the tenant's use of the premises? Might the panels need to be removed to inspect, maintain and repair the roof? And if so, who can carry out that removal work? When can they carry it out? And at whose cost can it be carried out? Where will the PV panels be stored if they have to be removed? Occupiers are going to be keen to ensure that the PV system remains operational and at the best efficiency possible throughout its lifespan, and that the impact on their business operation by the exercise of any of the rights associated with the PV system is minimized. Having a scheduled program for maintenance and inspection of the PV system and the roof can help achieve this together with clear entry safeguards to protect the tenant's business operation at the premises. If the tenant is to purchase electricity generated by the PV system, then a PPA between the landlord and tenant will be needed. The landlord will also typically enter into an SEG agreement with an electricity company to sell the unconsumed electricity. We should also consider the landlord's ability to transfer the PV system and PPA independently of the lease, as I mentioned before. The landlord will need to consider the alienation provisions in the PPA agreement carefully. As I said, as standard, <coughs> we'd often see the ability to assign, subcontract or novate severely restricted in a PPA. If the landlord is going to transfer the PVA system, sorry, the PV system, then the tenant's probably going to want to make sure that it has a direct contractual relationship with the third party that that is that the PV system's transferred to. From a tenant's perspective, it can sometimes be more difficult, although not impossible, to deal with a third party who's not the landlord and has maintenance and repair obligations associated with the premises or rights over the premises. And I think that that brings us to the end of what I wanted to talk about in relation to rooftop solar in the context of a landlord and tenant relationship today. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. And now I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Ralph, who is going to give a landlord and tenant update. Thanks very much, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Ralph Bullivant, and I'm a consultant solicitor in the real estate litigation team, um, Hill Dickinson, in our offices in Liverpool. Um, speaking personally in relation to the talk that Rachel's just given, um, I was thinking about installing some solar panels um, on our roof at home. And I live in quite a well, quite an old, I think it's the, the an interesting way forward. Um, as Rachel said, I'm going to be providing a bit of a landlord and tenant update. But before we get to the, the, the main meat of the talk, uh, and introduce a slight element of politics. Um, so first of all, we've got a couple of pictures. Uh, nitrous oxide, oxide canisters, uh, the littering are parks and pavements. Um, they're generally regarded as being unsightly and a bit of a nuisance. And uh, the government talks about the need to crack down on illegal drugs and nitrous oxide or um, laughing gas is to be made illegal and the government is going to be cracking down on that. We also, sorry, we also have um, here a picture of some nice countryside, um, but the countryside has been blighted. Someone's dumped some furniture, um, fly tipping. It's regarded as being antisocial behaviour, 
and the government is anxious to try and do something about it. So the, the question I have for you, the audience, and I see we've got approximately 270 people watching this this morning, so um, hopefully we'll get a good response on this question. If we're talking about antisocial behaviour, what does that have to do with property litigation? And you'll see there are three options on the slide there, no-fault evictions, dilapidated properties, or lease renewals. And if you click um, on one of those three options, whichever you think it is, um, then we should get a poll result um, telling us what you think the answer should be. So anti-social behaviour, are we concerned about no-fault evictions? Uh, we have the government's uh, renters' reform bill um, that is meant to be going through Parliament and due to be approved soon, uh, which will ban no-fault evictions. We'll see an end to Section 21 notices and people being evicted from properties when they've done nothing wrong. So is that anti-social behaviour that's being addressed? Is it dilapidated properties? Is it tenants leaving their properties in disrepair and giving a problem to landlords that then need to try and deal with a difficult um, dilapidation claim? Or is it lease renewals? Is it the good old Land and Tenant Act 1954? Is it landlords trying to use that act to get rid of tenants on the basis of redevelopment and being antisocial whilst they're doing it? Um, so which of those three options do you think um, have to do with antisocial behaviour? Right, I see that some of the attendees have actually clicked, so we can go on to the next slide, hopefully, and see what the outcome is. Ah, right. Great. <laughs> so I've not done this before. So 32% of you think it's no-fault evictions, 50% of you think it's dilapidated properties, and 17.4% of you think it's um, lease renewals. Well, I'm afraid that 80% of you are wrong, because the answer is that it's lease renewals. Earlier this year, the government published its Anti-Social Behaviour Action Plan. And if you want to have a look to see what it deals with, there is a link uh, which is available um, on the bottom of the, 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 the related contents box, which will give you access to the plan. And as part of that Anti-Social Behaviour Action Plan, the Law Commission has announced that it will be reviewing Part 2 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954, has to happen this year, 2023, with a view to publishing a consultation paper by the end of this year. Um, so why is it that the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954 is being regarded as antisocial? Well, if you go to the action plan, tucked away towards the end, at page 32, you have paragraph 60D, which says that because of the complex commercial leasing rules um, are holding back high streets, the government's going to launch the Landlord and Tenant Review, led by the Law Commission, with a view to their reform. So our aim is to make the system easier to understand and more transparent and attract more investment into UK commercial property. Uh, so in the, in the action plan, this comes under the heading, Building Up Local Pride. And I think what the government wants to do is address difficulties that are perceived uh, with regard to high streets, where you have properties which are now vacant, to a large extent, perhaps as a result of the pandemic and um, lockdown and shops having to close as a result of that, but also because of changes in the way of shopping habits and people shopping more online as opposed to, 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 to going onto the high street and shop and uh, to shop. So more shops are becoming empty, uh, high streets are becoming deserted, and the government perceives that as being antisocial. And so want to try and deal with that by, by undertaking a review um, of the Land and Tenant Act 1954. Um, I have to say that does, be, 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 that does beg the question about business rates. Um, so far as I can see, there's no reference to business rates in the action plan. Um, but I think if you speak to a lot of retailers, a lot of high street retailers, they will say that one of the biggest difficulties they have in terms of being able to trade on the high street is the amount of money they have to pay out annually by way of business rates, um, as opposed to difficulties with regard to the Landlord and Tenant Act. But be that as it may, uh, it's the Landlord and Tenant Act that's being looked at. So we're going to get a consultation paper later this year. And what can we expect that con consultation paper to look at? And what sort of changes what might we anticipate coming um, in relation to the 1954 Act? I think the first thing I would say is the Act is almost 70 years old. Obviously, it came into force in 1954, so it's a fairly old bit of legislation. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that the, the landscape in terms of landlord and tenant was very different back in 1954 
um, than it is now. Um, back in 1954, leases were normally for long terms, uh, 20, 15, 20 years, perhaps longer. Um, that's changed now. Um, I think the average term of a lease now on a lease renewal is just over five years. Um, and certainly I've come across instances where tenants are looking for new terms of even shorter than that. Um, perhaps three years, four years, or perhaps five years with the break at one point or sort or other. So the whole landscape with regard to high street land and tenant, and perhaps what the Act was designed to address has changed. Um, so what sort of changes can we expect to come out of this consultation process? Well, we have contracting out. Of course, all that changed 20 years ago when the contracting out procedure was taken away from the court. Um, but there's still a process to go through um, if a landlord and tenant want to contract out of the 1954 Act. Notices have to be served. The tenant has to sign either a declaration or a statutory declaration. And there's a bit of involved in terms of going through statutory protection altogether. I think some element of statutory protection will remain. Um, but I suspect that in terms of the changes we can expect to see, um, the contracting out process will be made more straightforward. And it may simply be a question of there being a clause in the lease to reflect the fact that the, 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 the lease has been contracted out, um, as opposed to there being a need to serve notices, um, et cetera. Statutory compensation board opposes the grant of a new lease on the basis of either redevelopment or going into own occupation and is successful and then pursuant to the terms of the Act, it's obliged to pay statutory compensation to the tenant who's going to have to move out of its property. Um, that's meant to compensate the tenant for the goodwill that it's going to lose as a result of not being able to trade from that property. Um, I suspect for lots of tenants, they perceive that the statutory compensation that they receive is calculated by reference to the rate of rateable value, either one times or two times the rateable value, depending upon how long the tenant has been there. Lots of tenants perceive that as not being enough to compensate them for having to move out. Um, conversely, I think landlords think that the amount of compensation they have to pay is too high. Um, so one way or other, there may be some changes in relation to the statutory compensation that gets paid. Um, turnover rents and rent-free periods. Um, over the last few years, I have done a number of talks where we talked about cases where the courts have had to grapple with the 1954 Act and how it deals with turnover rents and rent-free periods and whether or not they should be um, included um, in, in, the, in the new lease. And I think it's fair to say that the courts have had some difficulties in relation to this. And, and whilst turnover rents and rent-free periods may be perfectly normal, um, in day-to-day -day relations between landlords and tenants in terms of new leases being granted um, that don't fit easily uh, within the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. Um, so we may see some changes in relation to that um, to make it easier to, to introduce turnover rents and rent-free periods in renewal leases. Notices and dates. Well, the 1954 Act is obsessed with notices and it probably takes up 50% of the work that I do and for a large number of property litigators in terms of both serving notices under the 1954 Act and making sure that all the dates are not missed. Um, and of course, a lot of the dates in the 1954 Act are very critical. And if a date is missed, then it can mean that a tenant loses the protection of the 1954 Act, uh, which can be um, catastrophic so far as a tenant is concerned. And we'll come on to, in a minute to talk about a case where um, notices were missed and the impact that that had on a landlord and its ability to be able to, 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 to oppose the grant of a new lease um, on the basis of redevelopment. Um, so are, are all these notices and dates too crucial and can, 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 can the Act be, perhaps be changed to take out um, some of these critical dates and make, uh, make the process perhaps a bit easier for the parties to navigate uh, without the, 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 the dates being so important? So there may be some changes in relation to that. And I have actually seen a suggestion um, that the whole process in terms of lease renewals um, could perhaps be put online. So you have a portal and the landlord or tenant can indicate on the portal that they want the lease to be renewed. And then the whole process then goes through the portal uh, online as opposed to there being a need to, to serve a physical notice. And uh, I think to a certain extent, we still have a post room at Hill Dickinson in order to be able to deal with the notices that we have to send out under the 1954 Act. So maybe a need to update all that. Has OMEI had its day? 
Uh, well, we all know the case of a May. It's almost as old, well, not quite as old as the Act itself, but it's been around for 40 years. And this is the case that makes the point um, that on a lease renewal, the new lease, the renewed lease, has to be substantially on the same terms as the old lease. And if one party, either the land, landlord or tenant, wants to make a change in relation, in relation to those terms, um, then they have, to, um, they have to show there's a good reason for that change to be made. Um, but that causes difficulties. Um, leases are changing. There's a need to, to, to modernise them. And in particular, Bill mentioned briefly Mies, um, and you have the parties wanting to introduce green, what are called green leases. So they want to introduce lit clauses into leases, uh, which are more um, consistent with the need to, 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 to have regard to issues with regard to, to climate change. Um, but it can be difficult to, 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 to introduce those new clauses when you have O'May hanging over the whole process saying that uh, the leases can't be changed unless there's a good reason for doing so. Um, so there may be some, some loosening of the grip that O'May has on lease renewals um, to, to, to reduce its impact in, with regard to that. And finally, we might see a change in relation to the involvement of the court. Um, the 1954 Act um, is still throwing up a huge amount of litigation. Um, and I'm going to be talking in a minute about three cases all arising out of the Act. Um, but is it right that the court should be so involved in the process? Um, and um, is, there, is, is there some scope for perhaps uh, reducing the involvement of the court uh, or perhaps changing the involvement of the, involvement of the court? Um, there are pilot schemes both in London and I think in Southampton whereby uh, lease renewals are, as a matter of court, a matter of course, taken out of the court process and transferred to the first tier tribunal, uh, which provides a quicker and what people regard as being a more efficient system to deal with lease renewals. Um, so we may, may see some changes with regard to that. Uh, courts no longer be so, so involved and perhaps lease renewal proceedings being transferred to the first tier tribunal. Um, so I said the consultation process or paper is due to come out later this year. Uh, and no doubt we'll be talking next year about the when we have some more certainty as to the changes that are going to be coming into force. Um, but as I say, in the meantime, the 1954 Act is still throwing up uh, a large amount of litigation. And there are three cases that have been decided this year, uh, which I'm going to talk about now, which arise out of the 1954 Act and another case which touches on it. Right. So in March this year, we had the case of B&M Retail and HSBC Pension Trust UK Limited. Uh, two issues with regard to this. I mentioned before how the 1954 Act is obsessed with notices. And this case shows what happens or what can potentially go wrong if the notice gets lost in the post. And the, also, the, act, the case also deals with a landlord who lost the ability to oppose the grant of a new lease on the basis of redevelopment because of that. So the background of the case, B&M Retail were the tenant. Um, the lease had been going on for about 20 years, I think, and came to this the contractual expiry date was in 2020. Its premises in Willesden, it was an old warehouse type premises, which it described as being tired um, and in need of some, some, some refurbishment work. Uh, the landlord, HSBC, recognised the need for that. And prior to the lease expiry, it did a deal with Aldi, uh, whereby it entered into an agreement for lease with Aldi um, that it would grant a new lease to Aldi um, if it could obtain vacant possession um, and they ob obtain the appropriate planning permission. And in relation to that, HSBC anticipated that it would be able to obtain vacant possession um, using the Landlord and Tenant Act and by opposing the grant of a new lease to the tenant, B&M, on the basis of um, redevelopment. And so having entered into um, the agreement for lease, um, having all its ducks in a row, HSBC served a Section 25 notice on B&M in May 2021 saying we're going to terminate your lease and we're going to oppose the grant of a new lease on the basis of redevelopment. And this is where it all started to go wrong for the landlord because uh, B&M turned around and said well that's all well and good uh, but in January this year, in January 2021, we served you with a Section 26 request asking for a new lease. And if you wanted to oppose the grant of a new lease, you should have served a counter notice within two months saying so. And he didn't do that. 
and you've therefore lost the ability to oppose the grant of a new lease on the basis of redevelopment. Uh, so the best laid plans of the landlord appear to have gone wrong and it had lost um, the ability to get vacant possession and had potentially lost the deal uh, with Aldi, whereby it was going to enter into a new lease um, paying a rent, I think, of £750,000 per annum. So a great deal so far as the landlord was concerned. Um, it was accepted that B&M Re Retail had served a Section 26 request and it seemed that what had gone wrong um, it had been properly served on the landlord, um, but in 2021, the landlord was still grappling with issues with regard to lockdown and people working from home, etc. Its post room wasn't acting as efficiently as it could have done, and the Section 26 request got lost. Um, and as I say, because of that, it didn't serve a counter notice, so on the face of it, it lost the ability to be able to oppose the grant of a new lease. So having got to that position, BNM then made application to court and asked the court to grant it for a new lease. And the landlord said, well, we're quite prepared to grant you a new lease, um, but given we're so advanced with our plans of redevelopment, to do to redevelop, we want that new lease to contain a redevelopment break clause, and, and we want the ability to be able to exercise that break clause immediately. Um, so on the matter going to trial, there were effectively two issues um, for the court to consider. The first being whether or not the landlord should have the benefit of a redevelopment break clause, and the second being um, what length of term the lease should be. Um, the landlord, I think, was contending for a term of 18 months, uh, and BM were asking for a term of 10 years. So you could get an idea of the judge's thinking in relation to these issues from this extract from his judgment, where he says, It is clear to me that. If the new lease did not contain a break clause, there would be a substantial prejudice caused to the defendants, the landlord's redevelopment plans, which are well in train, with the potential that the advantageous to them terms of a lease with Aldi would be lost. That would cause a substantial loss of profit, um, coupled with its intended aim to match its income from assets with liabilities in its pension fund. Um, so it's fair to say that the judge had some sympathy so far as the landlord was concerned. It recognised the landlord well, was well on with its redevelopment plans, and it was a matter of bad luck more than anything else that it wasn't able to oppose the grant of a new lease. Um, so having heard the evidence with regard to what works of redevelopment were going to be carried out, the likelihood of the landlord being able to obtain planning permission in terms of the works that are going to be undertaken, um, the court took the view uh, that, that, that the likelihood was that the landlord ultimately would succeed, um, or there's a good, 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 good chances of the landlord succeeding in opposing the grant of a new lease. So the court took the view that immediately on a new lease being granted to BNM, uh, it should include a break clause, and that break clause should potentially be immediately available for the landlord to exercise on six months' notice. And so that was the order that was made by the court. And in terms of the length of term, um, the court ordered that the, the, the lease term be for five years. Um, so for the landlord, having stared at disaster in terms of not being able to oppose the grant of a new lease, um, it was able to rescue something from the situation in terms of having a break clause that could exercise immediately um, on the new lease being granted. So the next case, another case under the 1954 Act, um, and this case, I think, is really a case about experts and the importance of making sure that you experts um, are, 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 are up to the requirements of what they need to do in relation to giving evidence and giving good, compelling evidence on behalf of, 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 of the respective parties. Um, case is Dunn Brothers Cash Betting Limited v. LNC Investments. Dunn Brothers were, of course, the tenant, and the LNC Investments were the, 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 the landlord. And the only issue for the court to decide on was the rent to be paid by... Um, the tenant. Uh, all the terms of the lease were agreed. And it's fair to say that the parties weren't that far apart in relation to the rent. The landlord said the rent should be £36,000 per annum. Um, the tenant said it should be £30,000 per annum. So only a difference of £6,000 between them. Um, and I have to say, for that sort of level of rent, I'm slightly surprised the matter went to trial, because um, I suspect that the costs of going to trial at the end of the day, would have far outweighed the, the, what the parties were actually arguing over. Um, so the court heard evidence from the parties' respective valuation um, experts, and it's fair to say, I think, then, what expert did better than the other? 
Miss Davis was the expert acting on behalf of the tenant, and Mr. Burridge was the ac expert acting on behalf of the landlord. And, and in relation to the evidence, the judge said, um, as set out on the slide, Miss Davis properly discharged her duty to the court as an expert in a far more thorough manner than Mr. Burridge did. Miss Davis found and considered relevant comparables, including those which she agreed were unhelpful, for example, a Max Spielman lease, and another example which the tenant barrister, Mr. Healy, had described as less good evidence, namely the pre-COVID transaction from a December 2019 rent review TUI. The judge went on to say that Ms. Davis has taken a balanced approach and one consistent with her duty to the court, and that is reflected in the explanation she gave in cross-examination as to why she took an average approach between the rent of Admiral and Boyle Sport. So one expert taking a balanced approach. Um, but the, of the other expert, he commented that given the limited number of comparables in Mr. Burge's report compared to those of Ms. Davis, I might have expected a supplemental report from Mr. Burge, and it's surprising that one was not forthcoming. Um, so given those comments in relation to the parties' respective experts, it's perhaps not surprising um, that the judge decided in favour of the tenants um, and ordered that the rent should be £30,000 per annum as opposed to £36,000 per annum. Um, and then as a further blow to the landlord on that case, I understand the landlord was ordered to pay the costs in relation to the litigation. Um, so um, a, a bad day for the landlord in relation to that particular case. Um, next, in June 2023, a case um, which sort of touches on the London Tenant Act 1954 um, and threw, uh, threw up quite an interesting issue in relation to uh, what you might describe as being unintended consequences. Um, the case is Avondale Park Limited and Miss Delaney's Nursery Schools Limited. Uh, so Avondale Park were the landlord in the case, but they themselves were a tenant. Um, and they had the benefit of the lease granted in 2014, uh, which was due to expire um, as of 13th of September 2022. After they took their lease, Avondale then granted a sublease to Miss Delaney's Nursery Schools Limited. Uh, that lease expired two weeks before the head lease on the 29th of August 2022. But contain, and that, more importantly, that sublease was excluded from the protection of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. So on the face of it, on the 29th of August 2022, when it came to an end, the lease was excluded. The nursery school would no longer have security of tenure. They would have to vacate and Avondale Park would be able to go back into occupation and, um, in theory, retain the protection of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. Um, but the sublease contained a particular clause, um, which referred to a deed of variation and said that this lease will be terminated immediately if by the 14th of December 2014, the landlord has not produced to the tenant a certified copy of a completed deed of variation, which then dealt with various changes that were to be made to the superior lease. Come 14th of December 2014, that deed of variation was not produced. The parties didn't think a great deal of it until come towards the end of 2022, when the nursery school lease was due to come to an end. There were some negotiations between the parties with a view to the nursery school taking a new lease and what the rent should be in relation to that lease. Uh, terms couldn't be agreed. Things all started to get a bit nasty. Um, the nursery school withheld rent and Avondale purported to forfeit the lease on the basis of non-payment for rent. The nursery school applied to the court for an injunction to be allowed back into the property. The court granted that injunction, and it all went off to the Court of Appeal. And the issue, the primary issue for the Court of Appeal, was well, the impact of this clause um, that said that the lease would be terminated immediately if this particular document wasn't produced by the 14th of December 2014. And the Court of Appeal agreed with the lower court that the, the clause did what it said, um, that, 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 that the impact of the clause was that the sublease came to an end as of the 14th of December 2014. It was terminated as at that date. And as I said before, that sublease was protected, sorry, was excluded from the protection of the 1954 Act. So that excluded sublease came to an end in December 2014. And after that date, the nursery school had continued to occupy the property as a periodic tenant, uh, 
and importantly, a periodic tenant with the benefit of the protection of the 1954 Act. So come 29th of August 2022, that periodic tenancy did not come to an end. Um, they were entitled to hold over under the 1954 Act, uh, which meant that Avondale Park weren't able to go back into occupation. And because they weren't, because Avondale Park weren't in occupation at the end of their lease term um, in September 2022, um, they lost the protection of the 1954 Act. Um, so quite an interesting case um, as to the unintended consequences of a clause going back to 2014 um, and the difficulties that that caused Avondale Park Limited. As I said, it went up to the Court of Appeal. Um, the Court of Appeal didn't deal with all of the issues on, in the case, and there was some argument between the parties as to whether or not the fact that the parties since 2014 had always proceeded on the basis the sublease was in place, um, did that mean because they'd always proceeded on that basis that the reality was the sublease remained in place um, and remained excluded from the Act? Um, that issue wasn't determined by the Court of Appeal. Um, it was sent down to the lower court, um, but whether we get a determination on that um, is not clear because it may be that Avondale at this stage has decided not to continue with the litigation. Um, but quite an interesting case in relation to, 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 to that. Right, the final case I'm going to talk about, um, it takes us right back to the 1954 Act. Um, and is the case of BMW UK Limited and K Group Holdings Limited, um, decided in July 2023. Um, and there are two issues in relation to this case. Again, it was a landlord wanting a break clause in the lease. Um, this time, the landlord wanted a break clause because they said they wanted to go into own occupation um, as opposed to wanting to redevelop. And the issue, the other issue, was in relation to the amount of rent to be paid under the renewal lease. Uh, the case concerned premises in Park Lane. Um, in fact, it was a BMW showroom there, um, and BMW occupied the showroom under four separate leases. Um, and although all the properties were sort of bound together, there were four separate leases. Um, it case involved some discussion of other um, sporty car showrooms in and around Park Lane, Belgravia Square and Barclay Square, I think and showrooms involving Aston Martin, um, Rolls-Royce, Bentley, etc. So you're interested in those sort of cars. It might be quite an interesting judgment to read um, about all the showrooms in that part of London where these people operate. But in terms of this particular property, um, the landlord was arguing that in relation to one of the leases um, that BMW had, that on the lease renewal, it should have the benefit of a break clause because it said it wanted to go into its own occupation. The court was not desperately impressed with the landlord's arguments in that, in relation to that, and very much took the view uh, that the landlord was arguing for the break clause, not so much because it wanted to go into its own occupation, but more because the landlord was unhappy with the way that negotiations had gone with regard to, to, to trying to agree a rent. Um, they wanted to put some pressure on BMW to agree a better rent. So in relation to that, the court said, um, of the landlord's witness, uh, Mr. Carradine, um, that he was feeling slighted by BMW and by his concerns at the level of rent being offered, um, but in precise and unclear possibilities, not evidenced by anything other than some vaguely referenced meetings or discussions, are not enough to persuade me that on balance, KGH, the landlord, should be entitled to a break clause. I also find that there was an element of tactics about the proposed break clause. Um, so the judge in this case decided that the landlord should not have the benefit of a break clause. I think, we go back to the B&M and HSB case, um, I think what this says, that if, if as a landlord on a lease renewal, um, you want to argue for the inclusion of a break clause in the new lease, um, you have to have all your ducks in a row with regard to that. You have to have your evidence and support. And if there's a suggestion, you're simply arguing for the break clause in order to be able to try and get some tactical advantage over the tenant in relation to rent, um, then they run the risk that the court will see through that and will not give you the great break clause that you're seeking. And so the other issue between the parties was in relation to, 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 to rent. And by way of contrast to the Dunn Brothers case that I spoke about a few minutes ago, uh, here we were talking about serious numbers, as you might expect, as we're talking about Park Lane in London. And there was a significant difference between the parties. 
The landlord was arguing for rent of 2.3 million pounds, and the tenant was arguing for a rent of 810,000 pounds. Um, so we're talking millions of pounds here, and a difference of, in excess of a million pounds between what the landlord said the rent should be and, and the tenant said the rent should be. And so in relation to the rent, again, it was a bit of a battle between the experts. And it's fair to say here that the judge had some criticism for both of, both of the ex, both, 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 both of the party's experts. In relation to the tenant's expert, the judge said that it was more than a bit uncertain about those figures and arise them again after a short adjournment. I thought that Mr Locke, the tenant's expert, seemed rather uncomfortable about this and that his subsequent oral evidence never fully recovered. And then for the landlord, he said, in contrast, Mr Perry, the landlord's expert, was very confident about his evidence, but this was to the point of self-satisfaction. <laughs> and there were times when I thought he was less trying to help the court um, than assuming the mantle of an advocate for KGH. So again, there, a bit of a comment about the experts. Um, the importance of the experts in top, is on top of what it is that they're talking about um, and is com are confident in relation to their figures. Um, but also a hint of a warning there in relation to the landlord's expert uh, about not being overconfident, about the court not perceiving um, that the expert is there uh, not so much as providing evidence in their expert opinion for the court, um, but acting as an advocate for the parties. Um, and perhaps not surprising, given the judge's comments uh, with regard to the party's respective experts, where he came down to on the rent was somewhere in the middle, and the judge decided the rent should be 1.4 million. Um, so not quite exactly halfway between 810,000 and 2.3 million, uh, but not too far off it. Just some one final comment with regard to this particular case. Um, I won't read the whole of this quote, but one of the party's barristers in relation to some of the legal argument on the case uh, was suggesting that BMW uh, were a special value, was, were a special purchaser in, in relation to this particular property, and that because of the nature of the property and BMW and the type of business they wanted to operate from the property would be willing to pay a higher level of rent um, than you might otherwise expect. Um, and on that, the judge said that this type of valuation is really a question of negotiation between a willing landlord and a willing tenant, where a landlord wants the highest possible rent and the tenant is a long way below at the lowest possible rent, which I suppose in a way is what, all, what, is what happens on all these renewals when the parties are wanting to argue about rent. The landlord wants the highest possible rent and the tenant wants the lowest possible rent. Uh, but the judge went on to say that this is, as Mr Jordan put it, that was the barrister, a question of higgling. I would have said haggling, but as always thought haggling, higgling referred to an element of sharp practice, but it does not much matter. So the important thing from there, I think, that higgle is a word. I looked it up last night, and it's an old-fashioned word for haggle. Um, so on a lease renewal, you have a higgle between reasonable persons in the position of these parties, where one vacant unit is vacant and to let. Ultimately, there's going to be an agreement between the parties after the higgling, where the parties' agreement would be on the spectrum that one would depend on the strengths of their respective arguments. Uh, so I think there, the lesson on lease renewal, uh, where there is an argument between the parties in relation to what the rent should be, don't forget to higgle. Thank you very much. I hope some of that was of interest to you. And I'm now going to hand over to Bill, hopefully. And if there are any questions, um, then we'll be able to deal with those now. But thanks very much for listening this morning. Thank you, Ralph, and a massive thank you to all three speakers this morning for your fantastic presentations. Um, don't forget, you can download today's slides by clicking the icon on your screen, um, and it will be able to revisit the recording using that same joining link that you've used this morning. Um, had a number of questions that have come through, so thank you very much for them. I'll try and sort of share the questions around in, in, in the time we've got left. Um, first one, quick one for, 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 for Grant on the planning update. Um, can you give us a very, very quick update on what's happening with biodiversity net gain, Grant? Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks, Bill. Yes, on, um, on BNG, we were due to have the uh, BNG uh, system in place from November uh, this year. 
Uh, it was introduced by the Environment Act 2021, covered that, I think, in last autumn's uh, update. It was due to come into force in November. Government announced two weeks ago, I think it was, that that's being delayed. The delay is, in essence, that the regulations haven't got through the system and the government haven't uh, found enough resource to get the guidance uh, completed in time. Um, the current intention is that... Uh, that will all be published by the end of November uh, with a start date of January for BNG for major sites um, and small sites, which is sites of less than 10 dwellings, less than a hectare or less than a thousand square meters of floor space for commercial will take effect from April 2024 nationally significant infrastructure projects 2025 so it's only a short delay uh, need to look out for the guidance as i say coming out at the end of november um i mean a lot of people are already uh, applying the 10 percent anyway to planning applications so um i don't think the delay is going to be significant really thank you grant that's very helpful um question for rachel can a property owner of agricultural land totally subcontract to a turnkey supplier the construction and operation of a small scale solar farm? Hi, Bill. Um, I'm not sure if I properly understand the question. If the question is, can the freehold owner of some agricultural property essentially let that agricultural property to a third party for a solar farm to be constructed and operated? The answer is yes, subject to planning and any restrictive covenants on your freehold title. If the owner of the agricultural property is a tenant, then the answer again is yes, subject to the restrictions on the freehold title, restrictions contained in your lease and any planning restrictions on operating a solar farm. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Rachel. And there's a few questions, several questions have come in on Ralph's talk. Just rattle through a couple of those um, in the time we've got left. So Ralph, on the BNM case, the court granted a landlord break option. Um, would this mean the new lease is therefore contracted out of the 1954 Act? Uh, the straightforward answer to that is no. The new lease would be within the 1954 Act. And on uh, because on a lease renewal, the court doesn't have the power to grant a new lease that's going to be contracted out. Um, so the new lease would have been within the 1954 Act. And on the landlord, HSBC uh, wanted to exercise the redevelopment break, um, as well as serving the break notice, they'd also have to serve a hostile Section 25 notice to say that they want to rely upon the redevelopment ground, ground F and the likelihood is they would then need to go through the process of providing the evidence to demonstrate that they have the necessary intention to carry out um, the redevelopment. Um, I would have thought that looking through the judgment and looking as to how far advanced the landlord was with their redevelopment plans, um, I would suspect that they've got a good chance of being successful in relation to that. Thank you. Um, so I think it's then a second question on the Avondale case. Um, as to whether a hostile Section 25 notice was served on the nursery at any point. Um, and again, the answer to that is um, no, I don't think it was. Um, the, 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 the case was simply around, um, well, really came out of the fact that the landlord had tried to, to well, Aven, the, Avondale, the landlord, had tried to forfeit the, the nursery lease and the, the, the nursery made application to a court for an injunction to be allowed back in. And it was really a question for the court to consider the, the circumstances arising out of that and whether or not they had the benefit of a periodic tenancy. Um, but as far as I'm aware, no Section 25 notice was served. Um, it, may be now, it may be now that Section 25 notice has been served. I think that would have to be served on them by the, the freehold of the superior landlord um, as opposed to, to, to Avondale, given um, how, the, how the case played out. Um, there is another question there from Andy Guest, which I think is addressed to both Grant and me. Yeah. If Andy, it's okay, I think I'll, we'll give consideration to that question separately, and I'll come back to you on that separately if that's okay, because so I think it's a bit, quite a bit bound up with that, uh, which we may need to give a bit of thought to. Fantastic. Uh, Thank you, Ralph. Right, well, it's 11.29, so as you're approaching 11.30, I promised 
We will send everyone on their way 11.30 at the latest. So I'm going to bring matters to a close there. Thank you to everyone who's answered, asked questions. Apologies to those we, we didn't get to. Um, I'd like to take our speakers one last time. Grant Anderson, Rachel Allen, Ralph Bullivant. Um, and on behalf of us all, I'd like to thank you all once again for joining us today. Um, I hope you have um, enjoyed this morning's event and found it useful. Please do complete the short feedback survey as you leave the webinar. We hope to see you all again very soon. So thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>